You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. In this podcast, and in true crime as a whole, there is one certainty. That certainty is that there are even more unsolved cases out there than there are solved cases that we can tell the stories of. Perhaps the worst of the worst is when you have a case where there are multiple murders that could very well be the case of a serial killer. This week we're going to talk about one of those cases. Eleven women's remains were found buried in 2009 in the desert on the West Mesa of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it's unknown if those are all of the victims of whatever happened in that area. These murders have been hypothesized to have either been the victims of a serial killer or the victims of a sex trafficking ring. Either way, all 11 of these women had their lives taken from them way too soon, and to this day they still have an air of mystery surrounding them, and they have the indignity of not having the end of their story shared and the guilty party or parties named. Hello, my name is Lance, and welcome to episode 75 of Gone But Never Forgotten, Multiple Unsolved Murders in New Mexico, The West Mesa Murders. On Monday, February 2nd of 2009, a woman named Christine Ross was walking her dog Ruka on the west side of Albuquerque, New Mexico, when Ruka would come across a large bone that was sticking out of the earthy trail that they were walking on. Christine immediately knew that the bone was unlike any that she had ever seen before, and she took a picture and sent it to her sister, who was a registered nurse. Christine's sister would tell her that the bone actually looked a lot like a human femur bone, and she said that she could report the bone to the police, which is exactly what Christine did. She called the Albuquerque Police Department, and they quickly determined that the bone was in fact from a human, and over the next month they would uncover the skeletal remains of 11 women and one unborn child. All of the bodies were buried in makeshift graves on the West Mesa of Albuquerque. Before we get into the finer details of the victims, let's quickly talk about the area and the time frame. First off, if you're unfamiliar with what a mesa is, it's an isolated, flat-topped elevation, ridge, or berm that is surrounded on all sides by very steep slopes. A mesa stands very distinctly above all of the land that surrounds it. The top of a mesa usually is made of flat, soft rocks that are capped off by a layer of harder rock, like sandstone. The area around the West Mesa was surrounded by development by the year 2006, and the site itself was plotted out as well for the development of residential homes. However, in the area, the 2008 housing market collapsed, and that collapse would occur before housing was built on the site where the 11 bodies would eventually be discovered. People that had bought the new homes that were built close by, however, would complain to the developers that there was a lot of flooding coming from the west side, and as such, the developers actually built a retaining wall that was to move the floodwaters to a retention pond that was built where the bodies would eventually be found. 
That construction project, inadvertently and unbeknownst to the developers, exposed some of the bones that had been buried in the area. The bodies that would be uncovered were women between the ages of 15 and 32. Most of them were Hispanic and most of them were involved with drugs or sex work. I am going to take a moment to tell you what I can about all of the victims. I will discuss them in the order that their remains were identified. Victoria Chavez was a 26-year-old woman and she was the first victim to be identified. She was identified before the investigation had even settled on the fact that these women were likely all killed by the same person or people. Victoria's mother reported her missing in March of 2005 after she hadn't seen Victoria for over a year. She told police that Victoria was on probation and was also a known drug user and prostitute. According to court records, Victoria had five prostitution convictions. Victoria's remains were found and ID'd through dental records. Michelle Valdez was a 22-year-old when she was first reported as missing, and she was the second victim to be identified. Her father, Dan, reported her missing in February of 2005. Michelle's parents would say that she was caught up in drugs, but her addiction did not define her, and they said that she wanted to get help because she had better plans for herself. She was said to always be smiling, and she was said to have a very bubbly personality. Michelle had aspirations of becoming either a singer or a lawyer. Michelle had two younger sisters who she thought the world of, and she also had a son and a daughter. Sadly, investigators would also find the remains of Michelle's four-month unborn baby. Court records showed that Michelle had been convicted of prostitution once. Cinnamon Elks was a 32-year-old when she went missing, and she was the third victim to be identified. Her mom, Diana Wilhelm, would report Cinnamon missing when she didn't hear from her daughter on her birthday in August of 2004. No matter what was going on in Cinnamon's life, she always called her mom on her birthday. Diana knew that something was wrong, and she did believe that her daughter was dead. Cinnamon had 19 solicitation arrests and 14 convictions, according to court records. Cinnamon was also known to be friends with at least three of the other women who were victims. Julie Nido was last seen when she was 23 years old in August of 2004 when she was at her mom Eleanor Grigo's house. Julie had always been small for her age, so much so that she got creative and would sew and alter her own clothing so that it would fit. She had entered the Job Corps, which was a place for underprivileged youth to learn different professions. Eleanor would say that Julie had started to get into drugs when she was 19, and she had tried to get Julie to do treatment, but she wouldn't go. Julie left behind a two-year-old son who she thought the world of. Eleanor knew that there was a problem when she didn't return to see her son. Julie had been charged and convicted with prostitution four times, according to court records. Monica Candelaria was 21 years old when she went missing in 2003. Sheriff deputies were actually told by friends of Monica that she had been killed and buried on the Mesa. When searches and investigation came up empty, the case eventually would go cold until her remains were found in 2009. Monica was said to live a high-risk lifestyle by police. They also said that they believed that she had ties to gangs in the area. Her family remembers her as someone that enjoyed laughing, joking, taking care of babies, and spending time with her family. Her obituary says that she will be remembered as a loving daughter, mother, granddaughter, niece, cousin, and friend. Monica had been convicted once of prostitution. Veronica Romero was 27 years old when she was reported missing by her family on Valentine's Day in 2004. Veronica is sadly missed by her parents Larry Jaramillo and Mary Jane Padilla. 
She also had five children, Divinity Jane, Nicholas, Savannah, Joshua, and Journey. She was remembered as an outgoing woman who had a zest for life and loved her children. Doreen Marquez was 27 years old when she disappeared. Doreen, as a young woman, had always been fashionable and took time to look good every single day. Friends remember that she was never someone to just leave her hair down for even a, one day. She took great pride in being beautiful. She was a cheerleader in high school as well. Later in life, Doreen would have two daughters who she loved deeply and ensured that they always had the greatest and most extravagant of birthday parties. However, the jailing of her boyfriend appears to be a trigger for Doreen, and she would find herself addicted to drugs. She would then spend less time with her daughters, leaving them with family. Her, her sister would finally kick Doreen out of the house and tell her that it was better if she left and left her daughters there. She told her to come back when she was clean or whenever she needed a meal or a place to eat or shower. Doreen never came back. Doreen didn't have any arrests or convictions for prostitution, but investigators believe that she did engage in prostitution. Sylvania Edwards was a 15-year-old girl when she was murdered. She stood out from all of the other victims. She had no known friends or family in the area, and she had run away from foster care in Lawton, Oklahoma. Sylvania was the only African-American victim. She had never known her dad and had last seen her mom when she was only five years old. Police believe that Sylvania may have been what is called a circuit girl, someone that traveled along the Interstate 40 corridor as a prostitute. Police also believe that she may have been traveling with others who simply never came forward. She is believed to have gone by the aliases of Chocolate and Mimi. Virginia Cloven grew up in Las Chavez and was 23 years old when she was reported missing. She was a fun-loving and funny girl that loved to do her makeup and was loved by everyone that knew her. Her teachers even wanted to adopt her because she was just the model person and model student. Her dad, Robert Cloven, has said that whenever she lied to someone, she would return minutes later to tell the truth because she couldn't bear lying. Horrible tragedy, though, would strike when Virginia was in high school. One of her brothers was shot and killed in a homicide, and a week later, at the age of 17, she would run away from home. She said that she couldn't handle being there any longer. Virginia moved to Albuquerque, where she would live with her grandfather and later with a boyfriend. Her boyfriend would be hit by a car and go into a coma, and Virginia found herself living on the streets. At one point, the family was supposed to meet up with Virginia in Albuquerque, but she didn't show up. Her father would last hear from her in June of 2004 when she said that she had a new boyfriend and would probably be marrying him. Robert would report Virginia as missing in October of 2009. Evelyn Salazar was 23 years old and her cousin Jamie Barella was 15 years old when they went missing. The two were last seen at a family get-together. They left together and were headed to a park at San Mateo and Gibson Southeast in April of 2004. Evelyn liked to camp and enjoyed doing anything outdoors. She was a good cook and she had a young daughter. She had been convicted of prostitution once. Jamie had no previous ties to prostitution and her remains were the last to be identified even though her family long believed that she was the last set of remains because she had been with Evelyn when they were last seen. Jamie was remembered as a beautiful girl who loved to spend time with her family. This is all heartbreaking, all of it. As I've covered in the podcast on in numerous occasions, oftentimes women, like the majority of these ones, become easy targets for predators. Women who are involved with drugs, and especially women who are sex workers, find themselves in situations where they are easy to access for people with ill intentions. And of course, as we have seen throughout hum human history, sadly, 
Women like these ones do not often get the resources that other people may from police and investigators. As you see here, in at least one case with Monica, it appears that friends of hers may have known exactly what happened to her, and yet the body was not recovered until the 11 were recovered. This murder case is the most disturbing murder case that the Albuquerque police have ever seen. As I mentioned, it took almost one year for the remains of all 11 women to be identified because of the states of decomposition of the bodies. There certainly were similarities for most of the victims. Most of the women were Hispanic, and most of the women had a past in sex work, whether that was prostitution or sex trafficking. Because of that, the FBI would step in and create a profile for the serial killer that was believed to be behind the murders. They would dub him the West Mesa Bone Collector. Unfortunately, to this day, we are left with only theories, though, in this case. The reality is that satellite photographs would show that the last of the bodies would have been left there in 2005. That means that whoever was behind these murders would have had approximately four years to cover their trail or leave completely. As you can see from the short bits about each victim as well, it was clear that women were being targeted in most of these cases, and they were women that were estranged or distant from their families. These women appear to have not been chosen at all at random. People believe that the police have not done as much work on this case as they could have, and the backgrounds of these victims may be a reason why, if that is the case. Over the years, there have been a few people of interest that have come up and been named in the case. None of those people, though, have been named as official suspects. A man named Lou Fred Reynolds was a pimp who had known one of the missing women for sure. It was reported that he also had photos of a number of the victims at his home when they were just missing women. However, there was never any physical evidence found to link him directly to the murders. Reynolds was arrested in 1998 and 2001 on suspicions of promoting prostitution. Reynolds died from natural causes on January 2nd, 2009, exactly one month before the first bone was found. Robert Howard Bruce, also known as the Ether Man, was sentenced in 2013 to 177 years in prison in Oklahoma for sex-related offenses that occurred in Norman, Oklahoma between 1985 and 2001. Through DNA evidence, he was also connected to rapes that occurred in Albuquerque, Texas and Colorado. He has not, however, been directly connected to any of these homicides or any other homicides. A man named Lorenzo Montoya was also dead before the bodies were recovered. He was killed in December of 2006 after he, was strang after he had strangled a teenage sex worker to death in his trailer. He would be shot to death by the boyfriend of the sex worker that he had killed. Montoya had a long history of being known to frequent sex workers as he had been charged numerous times for offenses. Montoya's girlfriend filed a domestic violence form after Montoya allegedly assaulted her. In it, she claimed that Montoya had beaten her repeatedly. She also said that he had done gross things to her and even threatened to kill her and bury her in lime. In December of 2006, he invited the aforementioned escort to his trailer, and when police were notified of what had happened, they found the escort's body outside of Montoya's trailer and partially wrapped in a blanket. Her legs and wrists were wrapped in duct tape, and there was also duct tape wrapped around her throat. An unused condom, a pillowcase, and all of the young woman's belongings were found in a trash bag in the trunk of a rented car that was in Montoya's name. Not for lack of trying, investigators had not been able to find evidence that connects Montoya to the crime either. Montoya's living room carpet has been tested against the DNA of all Mesa victims and come back negative. 
Even though no conclusive evidence has come to light that tied Montoya to the murders, his death and the last murder seem to line up. There were no further bodies recovered or proof of any other activity on the Mesa tied to this case after Montoya was killed. Co-workers of Montoya also would say that he had talked about killing women and burying them on the West Mesa. Convicted serial killer in Colorado, Scott Lee Kimball, stated in December of 2010 that he was being investigated in the West Mesa murders. He categorically denied that he had killed the women or that he had any knowledge of the murders. A man named Joseph Blee would find himself on the radar of investigators very quickly after the bodies were discovered. April Gillen, Blee's first wife, contacted the police a week after the first bone was discovered on the Mesa, and she said that she believed that Blee could be a person of interest. Police actually were already aware of Blee and were even tailing him. Blee had long been known by law enforcement. In 1985, a prostitute that was left dead on a curb was found to have DNA that matched Blee. Police had also come across Blee more than 130 times between 1990 and 2009, and most of those interactions came along the East Central Corridor that was well known for prostitution and drugs. This was also an area that was frequented by many of these victims. Blee was found to have had in his possession women's jewelry and women's underwear that did not belong to his wife nor his daughter. His daughter also said that she had found underwear hidden in the family garage. Other inmates have also told investigators that Blee has talked extensively about the West Mesa murders and even said that he hired the women who were found buried there. Blee has still never been named as an official suspect, though, in the case. However, he is currently serving a prison sentence for being convicted of four other sexual assaults. He has also been dubbed as the mid-school rapist for his activities in the 1980s. As things stand, this case is still open, and there is one investigator that is working the case full-time. On the 13th anniversary of the discovery of that femur bone, police investigators and city officials in Albuquerque appealed to the public to come forward with any new information that could help to solve this case. Mayor Tim Keller said, quote, The only way this case is going to get solved is with our community's help, or even communities around us that might know something. We need new information on this case that is that is what is going to lead to it getting solved." Unquote. That is where things are today. This case is still being investigated and for their part the city has built a memorial park that commemorates these women who lost their lives so terribly early at the site where their bodies were found. The park was dedicated on the 11th anniversary of when the bodies were uncovered. So, I come alongside everyone that's involved in this case and also make that exact same appeal. Someone out there has to have evidence or information that could kick this investigation back up. Imagine being the parents or the children of one of these victims and not only living with the grief that comes with a murdered family member, but also living with the knowledge that someone has gotten away with it or is still getting away with these murders. A reward of up to $100,000 is being offered for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or people responsible for these crimes. Anyone with information concerning either the victims or potential suspects is asked to contact the 118th Street Task Force at 1-877-765-8200. Area code 505-768-2450. Crime Stoppers can also be called at area code 505-843-STOP. If you know something, tell someone. This is certainly one of those cases where information can drastically change the lives of many, 
many people. And with that, we'll put a wrap on another episode of Gone But Never Forgotten. Thank you all for listening. Please support the podcast by joining up on Patreon, interacting on social media, and giving us follows and five-star ratings anywhere that you are listening to the podcast. Thank you for being a goner, and thank you for always striving to be better.